On today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast, Paramount has announced that a Naked Gun reboot is coming next year, but are movie audiences actually ready for spoof movies again? Also, we've got our first look at Bill Skarsgård as The Crow. Are Crow fans going to like it? We'll find that out. Also, there's a little bit of controversy going on, more controversy around Roadhouse. The writer of the original screenplay for the Patrick Swayze version is suing Amazon saying that they used AI versions of the voices of the actors to complete the movie on time. We're going to talk about that. Shogun, the first two episodes are out and they're effing awesome. We're going to talk about that. Also, Dune Part 2, the box office projections for its opening weekends have, have, opening weekend have come out. Are they high? Are they low? And also... You know, there's this little movie called Superman Legacy coming around. There are rumors going around that it's going to be like the second most expensive comic book film of all time. James Gunn had something to say about that. We're going to discuss that and a whole bunch more. The John Campus Show podcast starts right now. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, the John Campus Show podcast. Come be from right here in our quaint little studio, brought to you in part by our friends at Mint Mobile. I'm, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming, and all sorts of good stuff, not just giving you our opinions, but also giving you some context and background so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or completely different than ours. Uh, joining me in studio today, we've got Ray Ora. Hey, what's up? Also joining me, we got Jonathan Voiko. Hello, everybody. Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett. What a week, John. And most importantly, you guys are here. Thank you so much for being here and making this show part of your day. Here's how the show's going to go. We're going to start by talking about those predetermined topics I listed off. Then in the last part of the show, we're going to take your live comments and questions. Got a thought, theory, opinion, you know, observation, question you'd like us to address. As long as it's appropriate for us to address on the show, go ahead and use the Super Chat feature to send that in. The Super Chats are open right now, but they'll only be open probably for another 10 minutes or so. Fire those in, and we'll get to those at or near the end of the show. Uh, hey, before we get things uh, started here, you guys know one of my favorite animated films of the last bunch of years was Moana. I loved, 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 loved Moana. Now, of course, there's a live-action version of the movie coming, and they announced, when they announced the live-action version, that uh, Ali'i uh, Cravalho, who does the voice of Moana, will not be returning to play the live-action version of Moana, which made sense. Um, but they just announced she is officially, we kind of suspected this, she is officially going to come back and, and do the voice for Moana too. That's coming out next year. And I love this girl. Actually, uh, you can bring this up. Um, she came in uh, one day to our studio to do like a half day, you know, long interview kind of stuff. Ray, do you remember this? She was delightful. No, I don't. She you don't remember this? <laughs> no, oh my because God. I, I don't think I was going into the studio. Yeah, when time. she was, I was there, but when she when when she was there, Ray was working remote on graphics yeah. at that point. Really? I think yeah. so. I thought you were in studio at certain, that point. No. There was a certain it, point where I was just at home. I, yeah. was tending I thought I remember you talking to her. No, 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 at, no. At any rate. No. She this had a trench girl, coat. He ran away. I, I couldn't be happier for her that she's come back for this because this girl is an absolute ray of sunshine. Like, she's absolutely charming. She's disarmingly charming. Like, uh, she's she's just fantastic. So I'm super glad that she's going to be back for that. So, yeah, a little side note there to get things started. All right. With that down, guys. Let's jump into it, shall we, and start with this. You know, Naked Gun uh, are treasures. Those movies are so funny. Not all equally, but I had a great... You had a good Canadian kid, comedic, all-time Hall of Famer. Oh, he's one of my favorites. Oh, and it just it was just so well done. Like, it was... The Naked Gun movies came in an era when spoof movies were actually really good, right? Like, <laughs> you whether you had, name your Mel Brooks one. Mel Brooks did a ton of them. Obviously, Spaceballs is like one of my all-time Young favorites. Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein. High Anxiety. I mean, so on, good. you can go on and on and on. It, it just, he was fantastic. And then uh, the Val Kilmer one, Top Secret. I love Top Secret. But Airplane. Mm -hmm. Well, ushered airplane, in a new era. Airplane was yeah from the but, same team. But I still remember Top Secret. Latrine. It's so a lot of people would be shocked to find out that Mr. Carson from Downton Abbey was 
in that. Uh, Val Kimmer was great in it. Uh, uh, not Top Gun. Uh, the Top Gun rip. Uh, Hot Shots. Hot Shots. And Hot Part Shots Dew. And Hot Shots Part Dew. Dew. And I, I love Loaded Weapon. That was one of the last Loaded ones. Loaded Weapon was great. That was one of the last great ones in the early 90s. And then came the dark times. <laughs> where buckets of liquidized shit got poured all over audience members as they went out to see pieces of trash like Meet the Spartans and The Ilk. It just seemed like every five months, a new one of these complete garbage things were being put out in theater, and it literally killed the genre. It killed it. Not another date movie, not another teen yeah, movie. No those. more I'm going to get you sucker. Uh, no, those days were Those gone. are good. I, I mean, love that was the last good one. But that, yeah, but that was a while ago, right? Long time. I mean, so you literally had this succession of garbage that literally killed the genre. And now Paramount has announced that they are bringing back Naked Gun. Uh, this comes from the folks at Variety. Said that's a long gestating reboot of Naked Gun franchise with Liam Neeson. With the Liam Neesons. Neeson. Is finally moving forward at Paramount. <laughs> Landing release date of about a little over a year from now, July 15th, 2025. The currently untitled project will be directed by executive producer. Anyway, on and on. Most important thing, they're bringing back uh, Naked Gun, and it's going to star Liam Neeson. Now, if any of you are thinking right now, Liam Neeson doing comedy? I highly recommend you look up, go to YouTube and look up Liam Neeson, Ricky Gervais, and AIDS. I just put that into the search, watch the video that comes up, and tell me Liam Neeson would not be awesome in something like this. So, I mean, that's that's a great matchup. But, Rob, I've got a question. With everything we just talked about, like, yeah, there was a golden era of spoof kind of movies, followed by the dark times that just killed everything. Even with somebody as brilliant and, and such brilliant casting as Liam Neeson in this role, are, are, do you think movie audiences are ready to go to ready to try spoof film like spoof films again? What do you make of all this? Oh, I think this could be the return to greatness of great politically incorrect humor. <laughs> they have to skewer everyone. They have to leave our young whippersnappers that aren't used to this kind of comedy scratching or bawling their eyes out when the movie's over it's going to be so like if you look at the first airplane uh that movie is still one of the most hilarious movies ever made but it is so politically incorrect so <laughs> look look at and if you talk about the, one of the the great spoof movie of all time maybe the beginning the, which we didn't mention we talked about mel brooks but we didn't mention blazing, blazing saddles, saddles one of the one of which, probably the top five greatest comedy which of all now time. has a trigger warning when it airs on you know cable or people watch on streaming and it's like okay if you don't understand that this is a send-up of all of these things. It's politically incorrect, but it's skewering all of this, like, racism. It's, it's calling just, attention to it's it. It's destroying yeah. it oh, yeah. through through yeah. political incorrectness. Our, our, our world needs this now. And I would say go as far as you can. And, you know, for, for Liam Neeson is kind of uh, Leslie Nielsen when he was doing the Naked Gun movies and, and even when in Airplane, you know, and don't call me Shirley. I mean, he brought oh, that. Yeah, yeah. And so, don't so Liam Neeson can play. It's perfect casting because even when you see him in like Love Actually, when he's talking to his son about being in love, his son's, I'm in love, dad. His empathy and his ability to do comedy, even though he's playing off of his son, he's perfect. And when you see him do sketches, I, I, can, I can already hear what they could do in this movie. And I think it would be amazing to see if it's pulled off. If it's pulled off, they think, have to be fearless. I think with Akiva here directing, possibly, if that's true, I mean, this guy is, has comedy like prowess. I mean, this guy's hilarious. Yeah, he's hilarious. So he, it's 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 in the hands of someone who gets it. You know what I mean? Quote unquote, gets they it. They just have to go all the way. Yeah. Yeah. And we were having a really interesting discussion about, I still, one of the single funniest moments. You know, Mel Gibson is responsible for, I think, the two single funniest moments ever in the history of film. My number one, you guys have heard me say this before, is Spaceballs. I don't do any justice, but it's when it's Dark Helmet says, now you mean Lone Mel, Star. You said Mel, Mel Gibson, Mel Brooks. Oh, uh, Mel Brooks, sorry. Yeah, Mel, Mel Gibson. Gibson wrote the funny. Yeah, when Mel Brooks story. <laughs> uh, was doing, uh, when he did Spaceballs, and Dark Helmet says, uh, now Lone Star. It's all in the delivery, but now Lone Star, 
as Rick Moranis says it, you will see that evil will always triumph because good is dumb. I've never laughed harder in my life than that. But the second one is Blazing Saddles. Which so we need to distract him. He stand, the, the black guy, he stands up and goes, because you're the run from the clan members, hey, where are the white women at? And I just, I just died. And, you know, we were having a really interesting conversation before the show started about, you know, can a, a spoof movies like this get into that realm of comedy today? Because, you know, there's often this discussion about, could they do The Office today? Like, if The Office wasn't made then, could they have made it today? And a lot of people say they couldn't. I completely argue that they absolutely could because I think audiences can embrace that kind of humor when it's clearly coming with the right spirit. And then Jonathan brought up a great example. The Colin Jost, Michael Che weekend updates on Saturday Night Live when they write each other's jokes and they don't get to review them before they're live on air, it is some of the edgiest, <laughs> like, how can you possibly say that? But everybody loves it because it's <laughs> understood it's in the right spirit, right? And and I think The Office would be embraced that way today. And I think if they decide to do something like that, oh my God, I think it's in number two when she's climbing up the ladder and he looks up and he says, nice beaver. And she <laughs> brings down the taxidermy beaver. Any, anyway. A lot of people think you can't do that humor anymore, but I 100% believe you can. And I think the audiences will embrace it as long as it's coming from clearly a spirit of fun. I think the audiences will be okay uh, with yeah. that. You, you know, you might be right. It's it's interesting because when you sit down and settle in and watch a movie and they're going to hit you right in front and they're going to they're gonna drop those nukes right at... So the audience is like, oh, 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 <laughs> hey. And then when the movie continues on, if they do it correctly then people will understand what comedy is supposed to be. <laughs> over under 5%. Over or under 5%. We get an O.J. Simpson cameo. Uh, I think under. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm setting the number really low. You 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 <laughs> might get a reference, though. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a reference? The, the, problem is, the problem is he wasn't just canceled. Oh, oh no, he's, he's uh, a murderer. Oh, <laughs> so but I mean, if you're talking about go all the way, make it as edgy to the edge well, as you possibly can. It, yeah, I'm not saying they should. You know what? Clear, though, I'm not I'll, saying they I'll, should I'll do. I'll tell it. you something. They pro I'm gonna go five percent because because <laughs> there might be depending on how far they want to go. The a lot of the, our audience today doesn't even know who O.J. Simpson is, was, or why. They don't know. Right. So he might show up. Half the audience is gonna be like, huh? But if they went that far, I mean, yeah. wow. And but just for the record, I am not saying they should do that. I'm not saying they think they will. But I mean, Mike do, Tyson's in the hangover. When you said, when you, that's true. When you said, push it as far as you can go, I started thinking, well, how far could you possibly go? And that's when I thought of the OJ thing. And for those of you who didn't know, OJ Simpson appeared in the other Naked Gun film. Yes. Anyway, question is for you guys. What do you think about this? I mean, Liam Neeson in the role is brilliant. But are audiences ready for spoof films again after they the whole genre was so thoroughly destroyed? Whatever you guys think, let us know down in the <laughs> comment section bring below. Back, they got to bring back that little kid who's now an adult oh my turning God. around going, so do you like movies about gladiators? <laughs> Although that's an airplane joke. <laughs> that's yeah, airplane that's what I was going to yeah. say. Different movie. Um, all right. With that down, guys, let's move on to this, shall we? You know, yesterday we talked about how Bad Boys uh, 4 has moved release dates up a week to go head-to-head -head with the Crow remake. I believe that's July or June, no, I think. June. June. Coming out in June. And it's now going to go head-to-head -head with the Crow remake. And, you know, I, I kind of said it's probably a good move because if I'm... Who's the studio behind it? Paramount? Uh, behind Bad Boys? I think it's Paramount. I could be wrong about that. Mm, but I think it's Sony. Warner Brothers, isn't it? Sony? Oh, Sony? Sony, Sony, Sony. Or Warner Bros.? Sony. Anyway, one of the yeah. big ones. It's Sony. They probably feel pretty good about that matchup. I think they they have good reason to feel really good about that matchup. I think they'll do very well. That being said, you'd be tone deaf not to know that there is a cult following of the Crow. And we have been waiting. I mean, I was literally at AMC when we were still covering Crow remake stuff. Back when Jason Momoa was going to be the Crow. Back when... Uh, Jack Houston was going to be the crow back then when Luke Evans was going to be the crow back when Tom Hiddleston was going to be the crow uh, and then moved on. Then eventually they landed on Bill Skarsgård, who's terrific. And they said they were finally going to make one. Well, it is coming. And now we got our first look at Bill Skarsgård as the title character 
and it looks a little something like this. Oh. That's not it. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. There it is. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When I first saw the picture, I thought that looks like Bill Skarsgård going to a Halloween party in cosplay. That I, I'm Straight up, I'm just going to admit that's what, what it looked like to me. I then paused and thought, well, to be fair, if out of nowhere, Brand, we just saw, like, if in a vacuum we just saw Brandon Lee and his look in the original Crow, I probably would think the same thing. It just looks like he's dressing up to go to some kind of emo cosplay or whatever. But mm -hmm. it worked really great in the movie. The look of it looked fantastic, and it worked in the movie. So... I don't know. I, I guess I have to see this look, Rob, I think, in context. So I'm going to reserve judgment how I feel about the look till I see it in context, because I don't think just seeing a still image, given the nature of the character, is a fair thing to evaluate it on. So I'm going to wait a little bit. Definitely has potential, and I'm I'm dying to see how Bill, Bill Skarsgård has done this. What do you think about the look of the new Crow? Well, John, the Crow means a lot, the original Crow, to a lot of people. I would say it's the goth Blade Runner. You oh, know, that's a nice analogy. There's, I like that. There is, I love the crow. You know, mother is the name of God on the lips of all children. Uh, it, it is an incredible, incredible film. And uh, it's, it's, it's truly, uh, if, a mu uh, if a piece of music can be an anthem for a whole way of life or the way teenagers feel, this movie is that version of a filmed anthem of a way of, of, a way of thinking. And I would not want to try and duplicate its success. That said, after seeing Shogun and Dune this week, it is possible to update things and make them great. So the look is there, but here's the thing. The crow is basically an angel. You know, an angel of death, but he comes back because of the power of love, not just the power of vengeance. And the crow has a deep, deep melancholy, which helps people connect with it. And, and I think that this says more revenge to mm. me and more like it's this has this, this the difference between Heath Ledger's Joker and Jared Leto's Joker. If you know, and the jury's going to be out for me because The Crow is a very meaningful movie to me. And and uh, it's its 30th anniversary this year. The 4K Blu ray is coming out in uh. April. Couldn't resist. It is. Just, just wanted you to know. So, look, I will be cautiously optimistic, but I would say Bill Skarsgård, the trailer for Boy Destroys World, is the most bonkers trailer I've seen in a long time, and I believe he stars in that as well. Yeah. yeah. So Bill Skarsgård's having a, having a year. Good oh, for he's, Bill. he's been having a last couple of years. Pennywise, uh, The Crow. I mean, listen, it's at, uh, John Wick Four. Here's the thing: it's not just him. That whole freaking scars guard clan oh yeah because big brother is out winning emmys and being nominated for all the awards dad is still the man because dad i mean he's in dune 2 the right floating now. fat man he's like one of the best guys you can ever put in a film i mean th this family right now is just like killing killing it. it uh so good for them question is for you guys what do you think about the look of the crow? Is it working for you? Are you like me and you're going to reserve judgment till you see it kind of in motion and in action in a trailer? Which, by the way, with the movie being about three and a half months away, we should be getting a trailer probably in the next I mean, you just weeks. think about Graham Revel's score and then the music, the source cues, the Cure song, Burn. I mean, you got you, you, that movie has two soundtrack albums. You, This is a tough act to follow, man. I wouldn't want to be following because we've seen other <laughs> iterations of the crow, the TV show, the, the, the movies. It's a tough one. All right, guys, jump down into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys, that down. Let's move on to this spicy sausage, shall we? Roadhouse <laughs> Hello, has, been drenched, has been drenched in controversy because, first of all, you're making, if you want to go back a ways, they were originally going to do a re Roadhouse remake with uh, Ronda Rousey. Remember, for a couple of years, that was on the books. And then, thankfully, that fell away. Don't get me wrong. I, I really like Ronda, Ronda Rousey, but she has proved that she cannot act. So, I mean, that's that's fine. Then it got going again with Jake Gyllenhaal. Like, one of the, I think we all agree, one of the best that's out there. Jake Gyllenhaal's a terrific performer. Then they went out and got Doug Liman to direct, which I, I really enjoy a number of Doug Liman's films very, very much. But 
then Doug Lyman announced a little while ago that he's boycotting his own movie because, and we talked about this on the show, he insisted that Amazon kind of let him on, believing that there was a good possibility or decent possibility that this movie could go theatrical. And I completely agree with Doug Lyman that this movie <laughs> should be going theatrical. But then Deadline put out a report that said, listen, when, when Amazon took over MGM Studios, they went to Doug Lyman and the producers and the filmmaker and Jake Gyllenhaal and said, look, we got two ways we can go here. We can give you a $60 million budget to make this Roadhouse movie because we need to keep some money back for theatrical marketing, stuff like that. Or we can go straight to streaming and we'll make give you an $80 million budget, which, by the way, would increase the paychecks. 85. 85. I heard 80, but 80, 85, which would not only give them more money to make the movie, but also give the individual players a little bit more cheddar, right? And according to the Deadline article, they took the money. They took the money. According to the Deadline article, they took the money. Now, Jake Gyllenhaal, we talked about this yesterday, just came out and said, hey, listen, I love my director, Doug Lyman. He's awesome. Yeah, but Amazon was always very clear that this was going to go straight to streaming, which is, I mean, so there's all that. Now there's another controversy <laughs> that's spewing up here. Because according to a report that's come out now, the original screenwriter of the Patrick Swayze version of Roadhouse is claiming that the copyright of that screenplay is about to revert back to him. And he says that Amazon cheated to get the movie finished by using AI voices of the main actors while the actor strike was going on. And he's seeking in court, they filed a lawsuit seeking monetary damages, also seeking to bar the release of the film. This comes to us from the folks over at Engadget to write the following. I'm going to read this a little bit at length because there's some really good information in here that I think give us proper context, all right? Amazon is being sued by the writer of the original 1989 Patrick Swayze version of the film Roadhouse over alleged copyright infringement uh, in the movie's remake, the Los Angeles Times has reported. Screenwriter R. Lance Hill accuses Amazon and MGM Studios of using AI to clone actors' voices in the new production in order to finish it before the copyright expired. Hill said he filed a petition with the U.S. Copyright Office on November of 2021 to reclaim the rights to his original screenplay, which forms the basis of the new film. At that point, the rights were owned by Amazon Studios as a part of its acquisition of MGM, but were set to expire in November of 2023. Hill alleges that once that happened, the rights would revert back to him. Now, this is where it gets really complicated. Because as we've talked about a couple of times over the last few years, there is a thing in place where the original copyright holders who sell their copyright can get that copyright back after how many years? 35. I was going to say between 30 and 40, so 35 years, right? So on its surface, here's what this lawsuit's about. This guy is saying that, you know, in November of 2023, the rights went back to me. And Amazon couldn't finish the film because the actor strike was going on and that he accuses that they used AI voices of the actors to finish up the film while the actor strike was going on, which is a violation of the agreement between the actors union and the studios when they finally ended the strike. There are two big problems with the writer's argument. Problem number one. If what he says is true, and that's dubious, but if what he says is true, then the studio utilizing AI to mimic the voices of actors can't violate the agreement that they signed because the agreement hadn't been signed yet. The actors union and the studios had not signed their agreement yet to end the strike. And therefore, anything they did that violated the agreement before the agreement was signed is not enforceable. Like I can, Rob can sign a, I can sign a contract with Rob promising him that I won't wear plaid anymore. But if I sign that contract tomorrow, he can't sign, sue me for wearing it today, right? It's not enforceable. The second big problem though, with uh, the, the writer's stuff is brought up in the, in another paragraph in the end gadget article that says this, the claim is complicated by the fact that Hill 
signed a work-made-for-hire deal with the original producer, United Artists, that effectively means that the studio hiring the writer would be both the owner of the copyright holder and the holder of the work. Hill, however, dismissed that as boilerplate typically used in contracts. So listen, just because you wrote something 35 years ago, it doesn't mean it belongs to you. If you were hired to write that script then you never hold the copyright in the first place. Now, if you write a spec script and you own the copyright and you shop it to a studio and they buy it from you, you may have your rights reverted back to you in 35 years. That's correct. But according to this, Rob, that was not the case. He was specifically hired to write the script, which means the studio holds the copyright in the first place. So this is a really interesting situation. One, I'm sure the Roadhouse people don't want floating around, but he's talking about breaking a rule that didn't exist when they did it, even if they did it. And by the way, Amazon is denying all of this. And even if all of that is true, he may not actually be the copyright holder. Anyway, Rob, I know you've been fascinated by this type of stuff over yeah. the last couple of years. What do you make of this Roadhouse situation? Well, the, the president of 20th Century Studios, Steve Asbell, was telling me that there is a lawyer in Hollywood who specializes in this because... A lot of our favorite franchises, Die Hard, Predator, like Predator was a spec script written by Shane Black. The script, so and, and we've had the Friday the 13th case, the original writer of the original Friday the 13th case. The rights were interesting because in the original Friday the 13th, Jason Voorhees is not the killer. And the Jason Voorhees that we know with the hockey mask doesn't show up till part yeah, three. That whole that whole case. Yeah, but really the underlying complex. rights is very interesting. So what happens is the rights revert back to the original writer, like you astutely pointed out, if it's not work for hire. So this guy, this writer is this is a, a total cash grab on the writer's point uh, behalf. Because the deal would have been made that this movie already went into production. What he's arguing, it doesn't matter whether they used AI. It's still in post. It's a movie. They had to get into production and have the movie made before the rights reverted back if, he had, if it was an original screenplay. So it was already done in good faith. He already had a payment. Movies take time to go through post. They don't have to necessarily finish a movie. If the deal is made and executed and the movie's made, the movie's made. And when it comes to post-production... It's not just it's not just the voices of actors. They have to do things like subtitle the movie for all the different regions it's going to be released in. Amazon subtitles the movie for how according to his logic, it's not just the actors. The movie's not done yet. The movie's not done until it's scored. He's just saying like making it about the actors. What is that? Where's that logic? I think if I was going to play devil's advocate here cuz I completely agree with you. I'm on, I'm 100% on your side. I'm just saying from the devil's advocate point of view, what his point might be is that it doesn't matter when you start making the movie. If November 2023 comes and goes, when I got the rights back, and that's in dispute, then you can't continue to make something like recording lines that came from my original script after the copyright. Again, no, I don't think it, that holds it wouldn't water. Be, it would say that the movie, because the movie would have to be in production, because everyone knows, you know, because the movie can be in production for, a, it just, they have to have executed and made the movie before the rights revert back, because it would, it would be dated when the deal was made and probably when it went into production. But here's what he's also trying to do. He's trying to stir up shit. You know, in terms of saying, oh, the actor's trying to start, he wants to get SAG involved. It's a pressure tactic. He's trying to get, oh, the, SAG, the, S, the SAG's going to come in. And even if they use AI to assist during a strike, strike to finish, are you going to say then that everything that had to do with post-production? And like you said, there was no deal with SAG at this point. And who's to say? They've had other people come in to dub people's lines. They've used sound-alike actors. Yep. I mean, they would be actors. There's all ways to handle things in post. And he, this is a, a pressure tactic, a guy who's probably never going to get another paycheck for anything he's ever written any anymore in his life. He's. I think it's gross. Here's the thing. I, and now, I don't know this individual. I don't know Mr. Hill. For all I know, salt of the earth guy, wonderful human being. I, I'm not saying any of that, but what this strikes me as, and I, this, I'm just saying this as a fan, okay? I'm just saying this as a fan. What this strikes me as is somebody who knows that this has no merit, but is betting that Amazon right yes. now would rather cut a $1.5 million check to make you go away right now than having to bother with it. And I don't know if that gambit is going to work or not. Uh, no, I think that's exactly what's going on. And you know what? The guy got paid. 
He made his movie. He got he got the deal that he signed just because they're making another. I I hate this. There's too much of this goes on in the industry, and it's not good for anyone. Excuse All me. All right, guys. Question is for you. What do you think of this? I, I mean, listen, whatever side you take on this, this is just more noise that Roadhouse does not need right now. It's got enough going on. How do you think this thing is going to resolve itself? Whatever your thoughts are, jump down into the comment section below and leave your thoughts there. All right, guys. With that down, uh, we still got to talk about the incredible debut of the first two episodes of the new Shogun series. We're going to talk about the opening weekend box office projections for Dune 2 and talk a little bit about that rumor that's going around that the new Superman movie is going to cost over $360 million to make, making it the second most expensive comic book film of all time and what James Gunn had to say about that. We're going to get to that in a few things more, but before we do, we're going to take a quick second and thank one of the sponsors of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, my mobile service provider, and they should be yours, Mint Mobile. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of this video, Mint Mobile. On average, it takes about 30 days for a person to break their New Year's resolution. So if saving money was on your 2024 list, your odds aren't looking that great. Luckily, I have a 100% guaranteed way to save you money this year. Just switch to Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. I've told you guys many times that after switching to Mint Mobile, I am spending less than a third on my cell bill than I used to with a major carrier. Say goodbye to your overpriced wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected overages. All Mint plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And don't worry about having to change phones or numbers. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number along with all your existing contacts. So guys, to get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash cam. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bills to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. And thank you to our friends at Mint Mobile for being my mobile service provider and for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. All right, guys, with that down, let's get on to this. Dune just got came out. You know what I thought about that. Would I have a double header of greatness from a movie screen to a TV screen, a Shogun <laughs> makes its debut. Now, listen, let me give you a little bit of personal background and context here. Up until they made the announcement that Dune 2 was coming, I had never been more excited for a TV show coming than the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. I, I, I'd never been more excited for a show coming. I, I, I was ludicrously excited, could not wait. I was on pins and needles. Ann and I went to a movie theater to watch the first two episodes and as I said in my out-of-the-theater response, I almost walked out. Now, I ended up not hating the series the way a lot of people did, but it was a disappointment to me. It would, had been my most anticipated thing, television show ever up until that point, and I ended up not hating it, but disappointed. Nearly walked out of the debut of it in a movie theater. <laughs> so now comes along Shogun, a show I had truly been waiting almost all my life to see. But would I end up being as disappointed as I was with Rings of Power? And the answer is no! This show rules! Oh my God! I could not believe... Like, I was so ready to be disappointed. So ready to be disappointed. But Ann and I sit down to watch it in our little theater room, and the text come up. First of all, the scenery, the settings are breathtaking and gorgeous. The, the performances are great. You instantly feel immersed in the 1600s feudal Japan. Like you feel like you're just thrust right into it. Hiroyuki Sonata is the man. The, and you know what? There's not a lot. I, I already know I can hear the same people who maybe Dune doesn't work for them. There's not enough sword fights, not enough explosions. I, I, I get that. But the drama of it, the intrigue of it, the the honor, the like, I'm just watching every second of this, and I'm just like, I can't believe I'm watching this. Like, I cannot believe I am watching this. And the way I felt about Dune, in the sense of, it's not possible to make this iteration any better. It's not possible to, to make an adaptation that is better than what 
Denis Villeneuve did with, with Dune. Not possible to make a Dune iteration as good as that is what I mean. And as I'm watching this, and granted, it's only two episodes, just two episodes in. I think there's going to be 10. Just two episodes in, I'm like, it's just not possible to make an adaptation of Shogun better than this. Now, now, granted, there have been other shows that have started strong for me that I ended up not liking by the time it got to the end, right? I really like the debut episode of Obi-Wan. I really like the first episode of She-Hulk. Look where those went. So I'm not going to get too carried away yet. Who knows if the rest of this will be good. But Rob, I, I was watching this so ready to be as disappointed as I was with the Lord of the Rings show. And every syllable, every line of dialogue, the dude having to slaughter his own infant baby son because he spoke out of turn. The... I'm just, I was lost. The, the dude getting boiled alive. Like you, you felt the horror of that. And just like cutting away, the brilliance of cutting away to other places around the village, just having to hear the screams and stuff like that. The the sense of honor. Like even, like this one dude is a total jack off, killed his crew member, threw him in boiling water, but he sees him risking his own life to save somebody. And then when he thinks he's died, he doesn't cry. He doesn't whine. He's like, nope, he accepted his fate, pulled out his sword, and was about to kill himself. I mean, it's just, and the way, oh, the dude, they, I don't know the actor's name is playing John Blackthorne. Yeah, I don't either. No. Oh, my God, he's so good in this. But it all comes down to Hiroyuki Sonata for me. Like, this dude, so good in it. Hiroyuki Sonata, so good in it. I could not have asked for this to be any better. And it is, it is one of the best debuts to a show I've seen maybe in the last five years. It's I would Cosmo, say, what's that? It's Cosmo Jarvis. That's the dude's name? John I thought you were going to say Cosmo Black, Kramer. John Blackthorne. Okay. Yeah. Well, he reminds me, Anne was saying, he reminds me a little bit of Tom Hardy. And he's she, she's right. There's a little Tom Hardy in there. But Cosmo is fantastic. When I think of like the last four or five years of series that had this strong of a launch, I'm going to think of House of the Dragon, which from episode one, we were completely hooked. I'm going to think of The Last of Us, which right from episode one, I was completely hooked. And I'm going to think of Shogun. I, I don't know that there's a show that has started stronger. I mean, my all-time favorite, favorite strong start was the television, the NBC show Heroes. Like that right from episode one, like that that's the greatest start ever. But I think in the last five years, I don't think there's been a show that has started much stronger than this. I, I loved it. Rob, you had a chance to watch Shogun, the first two episodes last night. What did you make of it? The original Shogun, I, Claudius, Shogun, and the Winds of War are my favorite miniseries of all time. And Shogun, to me, uh, you know, once I read Shogun, the first thing I did was run. I was 13 years old when I saw it. I ran and got James Clavell's 1,200-page novel, you know, that Shogun is based on, and I tore through that book. Yeah, King Rat, Taipan. I mean, I, um, I, I love this miniseries so much, and John... With the kinds of things, we've seen good things, we've seen bad things. I have to tell you, I, I started this show, I wouldn't even say that I was going to give it a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I was already, I mean, I'm so primed, like at Star Wars has taught me not to be excited over something I love. This quickly <laughs> uh, dispelled any notions I had of not liking the show. <laughs> I was blown away. I was sitting there. And I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop, and I'm like, this is beyond any expectation that I had. Beyond the stars. And look, whenever I see something good, I think to myself the same thing on TV. I'm like, why can't Star Trek be like this? Because, <laughs> because the reason I love the original Shogun was because it seemed to me to be a Star Trek story where a human being goes to an alien world and gets completely immersed. And I'll tell you something. You know when this show won me over? When I was like, oh, my God. When the because this was not in the original Shogun in the in the miniseries. Yeah, there are changes. They, yeah, they there, made some there changes. But the scene where the the samurai go on board the English ship. Yep. You right know, at the, the beginning. Ship, right the, near the beginning. Yeah. Right in the beginning. They board the ship. And it showed them coming because 
that was the flip side of the aliens seeing what the Earth ship would be, you know, if it was right. Star Trek. Yep. And when they're looking around and and I felt because in the original Shogun, you're like you're with the West. <laughs> Great Fox Show, Show Trek. Trek. <laughs> but that was here was something that immediate I thought this was a brilliant idea because it immediately made you understand that in the original Shogun, we were always seeing it from our point of view. But the 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 samurai were like these alien barbarians, we don't want them. Like, were they here? So you got the flip side of what they were thinking right up front. So it created, you knew what kind of brutality was coming, but you respected them more. You weren't just horrified. And I'm like, that was a brilliant change because it showed that both civilizations have value, which I thought was a really interesting way to go. Because who doesn't love the Klingons? Oh, yeah. I like, I, well, without giving too much context, is when the one guy says to Blackthorn, if you think these people are all savages, go up on deck and take a look at Osaka and then come back down here and tell me we're the ones who are the civilized world. I mean, it was it was a beautifully done moment. Yeah, it was all, so good. Everything about this, the way it was shot. I mean, somebody said on the live that they love the way that Vancouver played Japan. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and and it's true. But, you know, it's it's kind of similar um, uh, foliage and things like that. It was absolutely convincing. The production design, the costumes. Are incredible. Everything about. I mean, the only thing this thing lacks is to share a fune, but you don't miss it. Um, I, it's I, so good. And and the girl from um, Monarch, so good. She, and I was worried because Yoko Shimada in the first Shogun. I mean, I still hear her voice. Do you want to pillow? Yes, I do. Um, I love her, and but uh, she's oh, and, great. And by the way, you shall refer to me as Mariko Sama. It's like. I almost had Ray redo our lower third names today. John Campia Sama. I wanted to put that in there today, but it's so um, good, man. I, I like you. I, I mean, now the potential for disappointment. <laughs> Better, like the the bar is so high for me. I'm like, who would have thought we would get a, a, a Dune and Shogun? You know, previous adaptations, but to get new adaptations of things that I've loved for so long. Oh my god! Shio wrote the John Campia show. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that would have been funny if that's what you <laughs> did. Right the John Campio show. So good. Ah, uh, height. Uh, I. I mean, oh my god. Oh my god, it's so good. I. I just. I. I and again, like Dune, like Dune. I don't think Shogun is going to be for <laughs> Shomilitude. Shomilitude. <laughs> <laughs> good I job, don't Marcus. think Shogun is going to be for everyone. Right? It will not be to everyone's taste. It, it won't. That's the beautiful thing about the art. It's great because those are the people I don't have to like. <laughs> but I'm so, we're narrowing it down. It's like so we're narrowing it down more and more every day. Oh, my God, guys. This show is so good. It's already been on TV for like 30 hours. Why haven't you watched it? And it's been in production for like 100,000 years. Well, I mean, remember, <laughs> they announced this show in the same Disney Investor's Day call that they announced... Fantastic Four that they announced um, like several Star Wars movies that never came to pass uh, that I mean it, it was like four or five years ago they announced it and it's finally here I can't it's believe so it. Good, it's so good dude so freaking good I can't, anyway. I, you know and, and I hope people go and pick up the book because yeah. that book is incredible people are going to look at it and go I'm not going to read that By get Dave it on Clavel. Kindle so you don't know how heavy it is all right guys what did you guys think of it? Did you have a chance? I mean, it's been out for a while now. Did you guys have a chance to watch the first two episodes of Shogun? If so, what did you think? If not, what are you? What kind of choices are you making with your life? <laughs> Go and watch it. It's absolutely incredible. All right. With that down, guys, let's move on to this, shall we? Um, speaking of gushing about stuff that we've seen, Dune 2, which I, I, I actually think is probably the best movie made in the last four, five, six, seven years. I'm, I'm not really sure. I have to go back and, and do a count. I, I mean, I, I just love it. Give it the Oscars now, just all that kind of stuff. You know I loved it. I don't have to do my re-gushing of it. But the question is now, how much money will it actually make? And that's where it becomes a little bit more tricky. Now, the first Dune made $41 million in its opening weekend. Of course, take that into consideration with the fact that it was during a pandemic. Uh, on the tail end of it, and... HBO Max made the all-time stupidest decision in studio history to take all their movies that year and make them day-and-date releases on HBO so people could just stay at home and watch them for effectively free if they wanted to. And yet it still made $41 million opening weekend. 
Went on to make a little over four hundred million, I believe, at the box office, regardless of those circumstances. Four hundred thirty-three. Four hundred thirty-three. Four hundred thirty-three million dollars overall, more than Black Adam did. And it was available for people to watch at home anyway, and it still made more than Black Adam did. So the questions become: How will it do with Dune Two? <clears throat> now it's funny because yesterday somebody wrote in and said, I, "It's going to make a hundred million. My my screens and my theaters are all sold out." And I said, I believe yesterday. I think 80. I think 80 is where it's going to come in. Well, according to Variety, that's exactly where the industry analysts are putting it. This comes to us from Variety who wrote the following. Ticket sales at the box office this weekend will be flowing as freely as spice on the desert planet of Arrakis. So clever. Director Denis Villeneuve, big budget sequel, Dune Part 2, where spice is an all-powerful commodity, is targeting 70 to $80 million in its opening weekend. Warner Brothers, the studio behind the sci-fi epic, is more conservative, projecting a $65 million start, though most box office prognosticators believe that the revenues could near the $90 million mark. Uh, at the international box office, evolved to 2021's Dune is projected to collect 80 to $90 million from roughly 70 markets. So what they're basically saying is this thing could be anywhere between 70 and $90 million. So let's say 80 for argument's sake. <clears throat> and it could exceed that as word of mouth continues to go around that this thing is freaking great. Not just word of mouth from the first public audience that saw it in Paris, not just from the early word of mouth from the critics who saw it, but now thousands, tens and tens of thousands of movie fans have seen it with the advanced uh, fan screening they did in the other night. Rob, you and I both took advantage of those. Maybe that number could even go up. But let's say 80 million. I think that's a good number for this. If it comes in at 80, I, I think that's a great, and doubling up what it did before because you're taking advantage of the fact that it's not on HBO now. You're taking advantage of the positive buzz, six Academy Awards that the first one got. I still don't see it making the 120, 130, $150 million blockbuster numbers opening weekend just because it is such a different kind of movie. It's not a movie that's for everybody. So it's not the popcorn, delicious, buttery, popcorn-ishness that, oh. say, a Star Wars is, right? But I think 80 would be great, and, and I'm still picking 80, although, Rob, the number could be higher. Like, the the some analysts are saying as high as 90. We've seen in situations like Barbie where the actual weekend blew away the high projections, do you think 80 is where it's going to come in? Do you think it's going to be higher than that? What do you think would be a good number for them? Are you uh, all I can say is it's going to go over 100. You do think it's going to go over 100? I think okay. it's going to go over 100 because the, the just gauging the the IMAX screens alone are sold out for weeks. It's kind of like what with Oppenheimer came out. You right. couldn't get IMAX tickets. And by the way, you have to see this movie in the biggest theater possible because this truly is, as you say, John, an experiential event. Uh, again, I think Oppenheimer, Barbie... These movies provide, they're very transportive, they're very immersive. This is following on the heels. People are ready to see something like this. Dune's been playing on cable now. People have seen it, caught up with it. It's like you said, it's not for everybody, but you can't walk out of this movie without being somewhat changed. Mm. I mean, when you walk out of this movie, you've gone through, you've had, a, 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 you've had the most transportive experience that you can have from a story that you've seen in a movie theater. And, and I, I just, it, it's so, it is a truly transporting, moving experience if you're open to that sort of thing. And you want, this is what you want the movies to be. And so few are. And I think Oppenheimer, to a certain extent, and Barbie, in a way, kind of did that. Maybe the Oppenheimer, the Barbenheimer thing added to that. But, dude, I, I, by the time this movie was over, my jaw was just, I was in awe of what I had seen. And, you know, there'll be some people that love the books that'll be detractors about certain things not being there. Or there's going to be people that are talk about how the movie ends. But I would say you're wrong because you can see what's being set up for the next one. And uh, I think this movie is a marvelous, wonderful experience at the movies. And I think people are, are dying for this and they're going to go again. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing it twice in one week, six hours of my time. And I'm driving <laughs> both ways. It was a 90 minute. It was a 90 minute drive each way. Where did you go see it? I saw it. Well, I saw it at the Burbank 16. Oh, you drove into Burbank. And then I'm going Park. to see. I'm going to Universal. 
to see it on the IMAX screen. On the there? IMAX screen at seven ten a.m. Because so, the one at Universal is like the true OG IMAX. Yes. So how does that compare to the Chinese theaters? It's bigger than the Chinese theater. It's bigger than the Chinese theater. Now the Chinese theater is still a great IMAX screen. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. It's yeah. it's and their projection system. The only problem with the Chinese now is half the seats are broken. Yes. Yeah, so you fall seats, back. You fall back, and I hate that. It's yeah. like they need what. Yeah, the, the, the springs s in the in the backs of the they're seat all just kind of go back really far. Yeah, and, 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 and it's all the great seats because that's where people <laughs> sit the most. Because oh, I was thinking about my second viewing going to the Chinese, but maybe I'll do Universal then. Do Universal? I mean, the problem with the Chinese is if you sit in rows M or N, perfect. Yeah, but then all the seats are sprung, and it's so annoying. Because you kind of have to balance yourself the whole time. How can they be so incompetent that the, it's the most famous because, movie theater in the world? Because they'd have to spend the money. They have to fix all those seats. They, have, mean, to, they have to fix all of them. It's not so bad that you fall out, but you just you just kind of keep going back. Yeah, you know, and you like, can't. You, it's it's not, hey, Chinese theater people, fix those seats. because And it's all in the same section because that's where the best places to sit. Well, are. let's not get sidetracked. I uh, because I, can't, I could easily go on. About, look, seat talk. I could see it. <laughs> I could see it. It's it, look with the high range projections being ninety, it crawling over a hundred is totally within the realm of possibility. I mean, it, it it totally is. But but then how high could it go? Again, I don't think this is the big super popular. Po like I don't see the hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty. No, I could, I'm still gonna it's say not for kids. 80. What's that? It's not for kids. It's, yeah, the fourteen year olds aren't going to run out. I don't think the fourteen year olds are going to run out. Kids to watch love this. walking. Come on. Yeah, I mean, yeah every, well, the kids are all about. Although this cowbell. movie's this movie's a stoner movie, man. Uh, People in, might take yep. their edibles and they're going to be flying high watching this. The dankest of the nugs. Let's just put it this way: I I would love love, but by me saying I don't see it going over one hundred twenty, I don't think I would ever love more about being wrong. I mean, if, if they came out and said this thing made $125 million, I, I'll lose my mind. I mean, By the way, Florence awesome. Pugh is a goddess in this film. Absolute well, goddess. Well, so is Rebecca Ferguson. Oh, so is too. Zendaya. So, I mean, like... And don't get me started on those worms. Yeah, and the worms in that popcorn bucket. Anyway, mm -hmm. if you haven't checked out our community tab today on the YouTube channel... <laughs> You should go see a, a, a picture I did not make, but you should go and see the picture I posted up in there. Plus, I mean, by the end of this stuff, this movie, just the, the slow build, it, you, you just sit back and you're, th I can't believe what you get to see in this movie, the scale of it. Oh, it's, it's remarkable. Anyway, guys, with that down, what do you think about this? How big of an opening do you think Dune is going to have? I, I'm still aiming for the 80, but I, I totally see that it could be over 100. Rob, I think you could see it being under 100, but you're going for the I'm over going 100. over. What, what do you think about the $120 million mark, though? Uh, you know Is that what? a bit much? It, it really depends because I think the one thing that I think most people that are cineasts are going to want to see it in a, in a large format theater, and those are going to be the first theaters to sell out. So people might wait. Yeah, because I, I would say I would agree with Rob when he says, see it on the biggest screen possible, but do not wait to see it. Like, like, go see it in a regular movie theater if you want, and then buy your tickets for an IMAX later on if you must. But I would say definitely see it on the biggest screen, but don't wait. Because it's yeah. truly an experiential event. Yeah, I can agree. It really agree. is. All right, guys. So good. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? I don't think there's ever been a more important comic book movie being made, and I'll explain why I say important, than... Superman Legacy. The reason it's so important coming in 2025 is because, I mean, the DC movie brand is dead. And they're starting over again with this new movie that's got to figure out a way to rejuvenate it, bring new life into it, kick things off as a, being successful, successful quality-wise, and get the audiences back on board with a DC-branded movie again. They got to do it. And this movie, I mean, it's vital. You come out weak... No pressure to James Gunn. Um, he actually responded to me. I wrote to him on his Instagram. He was put up the cast picture. I said, please be awesome because you know I am I am postponing my retirement for this movie. <laughs> like I please be awesome. He responded to me on there. But the thing is, it, it's so vitally important that this movie be great. It has to because you come out. With, with the, the reputation amongst movie fans of the quality of DC movies right now, and you come out with your brand new thing, starting off a new version of the cinematic universe, and you come out starting weak, you're dead. You're dead. So there's a lot of importance writing on this. And by the way, I've gone on record. I don't think this is going to be a big financial hit, and that's okay. 
what you this movie needs to be is good because it's not about the next movie it's about the next 10 movies right so you need superman legacy to be awesome whether or not it makes money it's irrelevant it's okay if superman legacy doesn't make money i don't know about that i i 100 percent believe that because you got to in business you don't just think about the next movie this movie is about setting up success for the next 10 years and so what is vitally important is that everybody who comes out of this movie goes that was awesome that is far more important to them because it's not about do you make $200 million in this movie or do you make $5 billion over the next 10 years? That's what they're more concerned about. That's why this movie's got to be great because they know going into it that audiences right now do not believe You don't in think it DC has brand. to do both? No, does, doesn't. Doesn't have to do both at all because, listen, it's like saying Disney Plus, when they were launching Disney Plus, they knew for the first five years they were going to lose money. They knew, they knew they were. When they launched Paramount Plus, they knew for the first three, four, or five years, you lose money. They know that. It's not about the first couple of years. It's about the next 10 years. And I think the same is true with this because they understand, Rob, everybody's given up on the DC brand. And they're not going to get them all back in the theater right away. And if they're smart, they understand. Look, is it impossible for it to make money? Of course not. Of course it could make money. But they have to be realistic and say, it's not about this first movie making money. It's about the first movie being great so the next eight movies can make money. And that's way more important because those are much bigger dollars we're talking about. So what has to happen, has to happen, is that people come out of these theaters having had a great time because if you don't, you're fucked. So that's brought up a lot of questions about, well, how much money are they going to put into this movie? How much are they going to spend? Now, some of you may have seen some rumors and reports going around in some headlines that they were saying that this movie was going to cost upwards of $364 million. To which I would say, are you crazy? <laughs> you, you can't. I mean, look, they just tried spending that kind of money on Fast and the Furious. And look how that turned out. You cannot, you cannot spend that kind of money on this. But these are the reports going around. Now, the reports got around enough that James Gunn finally responded to somebody on social media. Somebody asked James Gunn and sent him the links, said, hey, is this true? To which James Gunn basically said, are you nuts? <laughs> he said, no, that is not true. We are not spending. Now, the reports I've seen coming out of more reputable places is saying that they're going to go for a more reasonable, still expensive, but $150 to $200 million budget, which is kind of par for the big blockbuster comic book movie right now. Some might even say a little bit on the lower end if they can keep closer to $150 than $200 Dune 2 is less than $200 million. Yeah. So, I mean, that's reasonable. That's reasonable. Now, if it were $364 million, take a look. It would place it as the second most expensive comic book movie ever made they're saying at the end of the day age of ultron came around 444 million dollars now when you know you're going to make over a billion that's a little bit more forgivable i suppose avengers endgame they say came around the 356 million dollar mark avengers infinity war 325 justice league 300 million was all said and done so at 364 million dollars it would make it like the second most expensive thing ever and i'm i'm glad that james gunn came out and said well time out no no, we're not going to spend that much money on one movie. And they shouldn't have to. You got to spend more than $50 million, yes, but you shouldn't have to spend $250, $300, $400 million to make something like this, especially when you don't believe this thing's going to be a billion-dollar film right out of the gate. Rob, you saw the reports. You, you saw the 364. Uh, I mean, some of us have been saying that maybe James Gunn needs to s slow down how much he responds to people online. I'm glad he responded to this quickly, kind of put that to rest. But where, what kind of budget do you see it coming in at? And is it a good idea that they not go too crazy with their budget on this? Well, movie? look, I do think, like like you, I think this movie, more more than anything, has to be a great film. But it also has to prove that the thing about super, Superman movies is Superman Returns and Man of Steel both cost, I think, too much. Superman Returns was just shy, just a little bit over two hundred million. Uh, Man of Steel, and cost, that was like twenty years ago. Yeah, and yeah. Man of Steel was two hundred twenty-five million, and they they were considered both disappointing films. They underperformed at the box office, even Man of Steel. So I think one of the vital things about this movie is it has to do both. It ha they have to keep the price down, and I still think it does have to make money, 
because it also has to prove the viability of the comic book movie moving forward. Like you said, they're they're building there a lot is riding on this film. So they need it to succeed in every way that it can. And I also think that James Gunn understands this. I think he knows that this movie, he doesn't want to make a movie for $300 million because that's irresponsible. You know, you've got to keep your costs down because this is, he has to prove, I look at him as being in the same position uh, George Lucas put Steven Spielberg in when they were making Raiders. Spielberg was coming off of, not that James Gunn was coming off some movie that cost way too much money, but Spielberg had made 1941. Run away, they called it a debacle. He got everything he wanted because of Jaws and Close Encounters, and it didn't work out you know, early in his career. So Lucas told Spielberg, look, we're going to make this movie on time, we're going to make it on budget, and you're not going to have everything you want, and you got to come in at $20 million. And he did. And he did some of his best work he ever did, especially directorially. And Raiders is what it is today because of that, those constraints that Lucas put on Spielberg. I think James Gunn knows, as the head of the studio, he has to make a movie that is beloved as Shawshank Redemption is. A movie that didn't make that much money, but people love it. Another film from Warner Brothers that people endures because it has real heart. And people watch it now and they love it as much as they did in 94. 30 years old, like The Crow. This movie has to do that. This movie has to make people weep or feel a joy. It has to be the greatest superhero movie ever made. Not too much pressure on James Gunn, but he knows it because it's not just, it's the entire comic book movie genre is either going to live or die on this movie. Because when you look back, and this is this is why, one of the reasons why I don't think it needs to be profitable. Because to be profitable, let's let's say it goes on the higher end. Let's say they, they spend $200 million to make it. You know they're going to go not end game level, but they're going to go pretty hard with the marketing of it. So you're talking about a movie that at minimum is probably going to need around 500 to 600 million to break even, right? Look, they're not dumb. They understand. Look at the last eight DC movies that come out. One or two of them didn't even make $200 million at the box office. The Flash didn't even make $300 million at the box office. Uh, Shazam made like $100.25 at the box office. Black Adam, with the world's biggest megastar and, all, and, and 10 years of development and all this kind of stuff, barely made $400 million. Aquaman 2, coming off of a celebrated original that made over a billion dollars at the box office, the follow-up barely cracked $400 million to do that. So they've got to know, okay, look, we've got work to do. We've got work to do. Like the New England Patriots, the last time they won the Super Bowl, they lost the first game of the season. Okay. And I think if you're making Superman legacy and you're Warner Brothers, you got to be smart enough to know that with all the failure that the DC brand has had, and this is the first one we're kicking off, we're trying to win the audience back. You can't win the audience back until you win the audience back, right? So I think they'll understand that it's 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 a tall order to expect that the first movie will make $600 million with five years of failure as its background, right? And it's okay because I think if this first movie is doing exactly what you said it needs to do, I love the way you, you phrased that, the way you, you structured that. If Superman Legacy can do all the things you're saying that it needs to do, then you're setting up the next movie for bigger success and the next movie for bigger success. And if you're the Patriots and you lost the first game, it doesn't matter if at the end of the season you're holding up the Lombardi trophy. At the end of the day, if Superman Legacy isn't profitable financially, but it sets you up that the next three, four, five years of films, you're making billions of dollars, that's okay. But we agree it has to kill it. It, it's got to knock it out of the park, Rob. It needs to be an experiential event that gets you in the heart. You have yes. to, there has to be yeah, it real. It can't just be good. It's got to be great. It has to be great. It has to have real emotion. It has to have real, you know, I, I, it's funny to say, but that moment where King Shark is looking at the people from the bus when he's seeing the people, you know, the loving couples. One of the most beautiful moments you know, in the comic book film. The ever. whole movie's got to be like that. Yeah. you got to have those. I, I, I never thought I would say this, but Superman Legacy has got to have a lot of King Shark moments in it. And people are going to be like, what? But it's that emotion when you can make King Shark sympathetic by realizing he's never going to have a relationship like he's seeing over there. Because a lot. And, and look. And James Gunn can do it. 
Oh, he's it's not out of he's, he's and, and people that I'm, I've got my I, I bet on James Gunn because what people do not understand about him because they haven't seen it because it's he doesn't he hasn't had to show it. James Gunn is going to tear your heart out in this movie, and that's why it's going to work. Because here's here's where it gets this is where it's an uphill battle, Rob. Because it's challenging enough to go in with a um, what's the best word with a clean slate audience that's just sitting down to watch your movie and win them over. That's hard enough to do. That's a that's a difficult thing to do as a filmmaker. But that's not a clean slate audience is not what's going in to see Superman Legacy. It's a movie going audience that thinks very badly of DC right now. That is coming off of five years, eight films of, and a couple of those films I really love personally, but they completely flopped at the box office that the audience had given up. So like, okay, so it's like, it's one thing to take your girlfriend out to Chili's for dinner, right? Oh, that's nice. Taking her out to dinner. That's, that's nice. It's another thing when you're taking your girlfriend out, who's really pissed off at you right now, Chili's ain't going to cut it. <laughs> Right, Chili's is not what's going to win her back over, um, and and that's the thing. Superman Legacy can't be Chili's. No, and, and uh, wait, it's got to be. Superman it's got to be Roots Chris. So, Superman to follow can't be to follow up on that. When I say tear your heart out, I don't mean like Molaram in Temple of Doom. Right. I mean to use a Warner Brothers reference that I don't know if anyone's going to get this, but James Gunn needs to recreate the moment where Michelle Pfeiffer and Rutger Hauer see each other in the church at the end of Lady Hawk. Lady Hawk. And you hear Michelle Pfeiffer say, "Navarre," and you see John Wood. He's in his face, dude. <laughs> you lose, and that's what I need to see in this movie with the '80s synthesizer music playing. Come in the on, background. man. Bow. And if people think, bow, bow, bow. you know, I can say like the end of the Notebook kind of thing, or not the end, but you know that. If you get what I'm saying, and everyone should watch Lady Hawk again, you'll see what I mean because it'll make you cry. Navarre, so good. Hey, think of it this way: when you watch, if you haven't seen Lady Hawk yet, watch it and imagine it's actually Ferris Bueller narrating it. Think, <laughs> just watch it; it'll totally twist your mind. It makes it a, makes Lady Hawk a completely different viewing experience. All right, guys. Question is for you. What do you think about this? I mean, those numbers that were going on is $364 million. I mean, that's preposterous. Are you glad that James Gunn responded to it? How well do you think it can do? How well does it need to do? Whatever you guys think about that, because this is going to be something we're going to be discussing for the next year or so, I'm sure. Jump on down to the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. It's time for us to get to the most important part of the show, which is hearing from you, taking your thoughts, theories, opinions, and questions. Uh, but before we do, we're going to take a quick second here and thank another sponsor of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast, our friends at The Perfect Gene. Hey guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, The Perfect Gene. Guys, are you tired of the rough and rigid jeans crushing your boys? Well, today's sponsor, The Perfect Gene, finally solved all of your denim difficulties. They make great looking, perfect fitting jeans that are as comfortable as sweatpants. The secret? A special denim fabric that is super soft and has the perfect amount of stretch so you can squat, do yoga, or just sit around all day without ever having to take them off. I'm going to admit I was a little bit skeptical because to me, jeans have always been jeans. They're practical. Practical, but not always the most comfortable. But I'm telling you guys, it's not an exaggeration. Once I put on these jeans, the perfect jean redefined what jeans can be to me. They're the perfect fit, they stretch, they breathe, and again, they're just insanely comfortable. So guys, it's finally time to stop crushing your balls in uncomfortable jeans by going to theperfectgene.nyc slash campia15. Our listeners get 15% off your first order plus free shipping. Free returns and free exchanges when you use code campia15 at checkout. Again, that's 15% percent off for new customers at theperfectgene.nyc slash campia15 and use the code campia15. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please support the John Campus Show and tell them we sent you. And thank you to our friends at The Perfect Gene for giving my boys plenty of room to breathe and for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast. <laughs> All right, guys, with that down, Let's hear from the true heroes. You guys, what do you guys want to talk about? Jonathan, what do we got up first? All right. First up, um, Matt uh, Painter just gives uh, some support. So thank you for that. Thank you, Matt. And then we got um, Matt Painter is back and says, uh, we still haven't heard anything about Mom, Paul Kent, or Perry White in Superman Legacy. Do you reckon they're in the movie? I'm going to guess no. Remember, this movie. this isn't going to be an origin movie for Superman. It's going to be pick up 
with Superman already being Superman, already having been working at the Daily Planet for a couple of years. It's a younger Superman, but not a teenage one. Uh, you know, maybe a, a flashback or, or a quick phone call with Maquette, but I don't think we're going to see... Tell me if you agree with this, Rob. I don't think we're going to see Ma or Pa Kent as significant characters in the new Superman. What do you think? I, I, I totally agree. I mean, Pa's probably gone already. Yeah. And um, I, I, I think that that's not what they're doing with this. In the original Christopher Reeve movie, Pa Kent died before Clark went off to work at the Daily Planet. Yeah, that's what, right? the, yeah. That's what the, the, the catalyst yeah. was. And in Man of Steel as well. He was already dead. So, All right, what's next? Bobby Jackson says... Um, I normally don't get upset when the credits pop up at the end of a show I'm watching, but I let out a yell and was upset after watching episode two of Shogun. I didn't want it to end. That was oh. me with Game of Thrones a lot, too. Tell me if any of the rest of you do this. It's, I, I do this when I'm really enjoying a show or a movie on, on, my, on my TV. I will, and, and it irritates Anne because we'll be watching a show and all of a sudden I'll pause the show just because I want to see the time bar at the bottom of the screen so I can see how much more time we have. Yeah. And like, I'm just, every time I hit the thing, I'm like, please be like at least 20 more minutes. And uh, it drives Anne crazy when I do that. But uh, yeah, I do it. And I was doing that for Shogun. I was doing that for Shogun. I was like, please be just be another hour long. Be not, and, and the ending of the episode was so great. And again, Lord Toronaga, he's a smart dude, man. He figured it all out. <laughs> um, God, I love, and, you know what sucked? And by the way, I got caught up on Halo. Oh, yeah. This is a... Listen, I know there are some people that didn't like the first season. I didn't love the first season, but I, I was entertained by it. Whatever you thought of it, and I'm not saying it's awesome, but season two is a definite step up from season one. Yeah. And that whole Reach episode, I thought was really good. It, it felt like this this showrunner, the new one, actually listened to... Do they a have a new showrunner? Yeah, yeah. They, uh, I think his name is David Weiner. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, but uh, um, they definitely listened to some feedback, and it, it, it's showing in the product. I mean, everyone who's stuck with the show is probably enjoying it right now. They're killing people yeah, yeah. off in this show. I mean, it's <laughs> woo. I, it, yeah. But but like, Halo ended. I'm like, oh crap! There was only two episodes I had to, I had backed up to watch. Yeah. So it was kind of a, and then episode two of, and I like I I know they only released two episodes, but I ran back to the main menu to say. Maybe they dropped a surprise third. I mean, you still have some other good ones you have to catch up on, too. And I, I think you'll like that. I still got to get Cop House, House and Ninja. Ninja, Avatar The Last Airbender. I've still only seen the first episode of. So, yeah, I got a lot to catch up on still. All right, what's next? We got um, Sam Fisher who says, I, oh, whoops, got to scroll a little further. Sam Fisher says, Shogun was amazing. My favorite scenes were the ones with uh, Tora Naga and Blackthorn together. Yeah. Uh, Hiroyuki Sonata and Cosmo Jarvis have fantastic. So history. good together. They they really do. But the chemistry to me that really has to work is Blackthorn. Blackthorn, and I still I can't remember if it's Rodriguez or what is the character's name? The the John Reese Davies character. Uh, look it up. Why am I drawing? I want to say Rodrigo, but I think maybe it's Rodriguez. It's Ramirez. Is it no? No, it's not Ramirez. That's yes. that's uh, that's yeah. Highlander. Yeah, that's Highlander. I think it's Rodriguez. Anyway, Inglés. Yes. Um, that's the chemistry that oh, Calvin Patel is saying in the live chat that it's Rodriguez. Yeah, it is Rodriguez. Calvin. So that's the chemistry to me, Rodriguez and Blackthorn, that really has to sing, and it was really working for me in the first couple of hours. For those of you who thought I might recognize, who's that guy playing Rodriguez? If any of you guys saw the live action Fox series of The Tick, where Putty played The Tick, Rodriguez is the guy who played Deflator Mouse uh, in that. And I've, I've always liked that guy. All right, what's next? We got, um, let's see. I think it's, yeah, Butter My Crumpet says, how great of a role is Florence Pugh on right now? Last year, Oppenheimer, and now this year, Dune 2. Yep. Not the most major significant character in either, but great in both of them. Like, she, what she did in Oppenheimer was wonderful. Her playing the princess, I mean, she had limited screen time, but man, she made the best use of every moment of screen time. And uh, yeah, it's kind of... Right now, the world kind of belongs to two actresses. It's Florence Pugh and Anya Taylor-Joy. It's been the two of them for the last couple of years, right? And the fact that they both pop up in this movie is great. 
Um, by the way, can I just say, I had so many people write to me and say, oh, thanks for spoiling Andy Taylor Joy's cameo in the movie. I did it, blah, 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 blah. It was fucking publicly announced that Anya Taylor Joy was, was at the premiere of the red she carpet. Was, they interviewed her on all the outlets on the premiere of the red carpet. There were literally headlines and all the trades about Anya Taylor Joy makes appearance in the thing. We did not spoil anything. It was publicly available knowledge. Also, it's not like this is, isn't the third adaptation of Dune and the book has been around since 65. I mean, it's, I don't think you can possibly spoil the plot of Dune. I mean, look, my wife didn't know anything about Dune. Right. She she never watched any of it. She knew nothing, although she bought Dune Messiah. She bought the book so she can see. I'm oh, like, I can't wait to hear what she thinks like, about I, that. I warned her last night. I said, honey, I don't think you're going to like Dune Messiah. I think you're going to get really mad about what they do with some of the characters. I'm, I'm actually I feel that way for a lot of the audience. I, I think there's going to be a lot of audience people who do not like Dune Messiah, Dune Messiah. is kind of like The Last of Us, too. Only way more so like. <laughs> way more so i told the analogy is perfect but it's like imagine what they do with the one character in last of us 2 and they do that with all of them or <laughs> what they do with that one character but actually that one character does something terrible to our main character yeah that's something like really I mean, oh yeah i mean lots of people do a lot of terrible things that one character imagine last of us character. 2 was joel just beating up ellie yeah it's just, <laughs> it's just but you know what i will say this because there's a lot of people that who know the books, who know the lore. There's tons of people that are big uh, Frank Herbert acolytes. And, and, and the very end of the movie has become, in terms of people I've talked to, a little controversial. I would say that I know where Denis Villeneuve, I think, is going with this. And somebody brought it up to me last night. This is going to be, the Doom Messiah is going to end this. It's an epic tragedy. The whole thing is an epic tragedy. And well, he's doing At the end of the day, it. like, Herbert was making a cautionary tale about messiah figures yes right so yeah the, and and it really is that way but i think he's going to make it an emotional tragedy kind of like very very godfather very godfather all right what's next you were talking about vasco rodriguez in the shogun series if that's his name i didn't yeah. know the actor's he's name played by up. nestor carbonel yeah Car yes and carbonel. he i remember the i think i think correct me if i'm wrong was he not in what was that sitcom? I thought he was in the sitcom with David Spade. There's uh, Bates Motel. He was he's, way before he's, that. He's been in so many cool things. The Morning things. Show. I know, I'm, not, I'm talking like 15 years ago. I'm not talking like mm. in the last couple of years. But if you go back like to at least like, like 2000, or maybe like 2005 and earlier, if there's anything notable that I'm trying to think, because you see his face pop up all the time. He's in Wilfred, State of Affairs, The Good Wife. I, I never watched The Good yeah. Wife. All right, anyway, what's anyway. next? All right, so actually... Oh, Lost. He was in Lost. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, go. let's go. <laughs> All right, so actually that was Bobby Jackson, who was last. This is Butter My Crumpet with a two-parter. Hey, guys, I'm dealing with depression. I don't think much of myself, and I think I have no talent or uh, nothing. I feel lonely. Um, but part two says, watching your show and everyone on it really helps give me one more day of life. So thank you. By the way, I hope this isn't a stupid question. It's not stupid at all. Thank you for sharing that. Sorry. What the hell is that? His phone to turn is freaking my, out. I, I hit a button looking for Nestor. <laughs> That's all right. I yeah. muted you. <laughs> um, listen, uh, first of all, I would say uh, it's just an honor that you're here and watching our show with us. That's one of the great things about the film fan community. But I would also go one step further and suggest this. Look. All of us, when we're feeling physically weak, what do we do? We go to the gym, right? And we encourage each other, go to the gym, do something that, that exercises the muscles, get yourself a little bit stronger, right? There has been for too long, you guys have heard me say this before, there's for too long been a stigma, especially on men, to mentally take care of ourselves, right? There's been a stigma attached to that. like, like. We feel physically weak, going to the gym, we applaud each other. We encourage each other. Yeah, go go hit the gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's almost like we've been uh, ashamed or nervous to say that about taking care of ourselves yeah. mentally, right? Nah, I we're glad that you're here. Taking part in these discussions is great and it's positive, it's awesome. But don't stop there. Seek out professional help, just like going to the gym. Right, we've had sponsors on our show like Better Help. Uh, they they are not the sponsor of of today's episode, but you know I'll bring that up. Like even if you want to do something as simple as that, absolutely. Like when you're a guy, you don't like the way your shoulders look, you don't like the size of your arms, 
do something about it. Go to the gym, start, start the slow process of building up your physical health. And if you're recognizing that, you know what, and we've all been there, but if you're recognizing you're in a place that, you know what, I'm not doing mentally so well right now, do something about it. And, and we're glad that you're here and that's a great first thing, but take that next step and, um, whether it's something like a better helps if seeking an in-person therapist, go talk to people. It's an awesome thing for men to do because we should be looking after our mental health the same way we look after our physical health. So we're, we're glad you're here. I'm glad you, you said like you're acknowledged where you're at, but do something about it too. And I really want to encourage you to do that. And, and don't give up on yourself. You know what I'm saying? Like there's a lot of things that are coming. I have a feeling that, uh, you don't want to miss, you know what I mean? We have a lot of stuff on the screens that is coming out. You know, find the things that make you happy and uh, just concentrate on that. You know, if I could add to that here, I think that we don't see and talk to each other enough. Call up a friend of yours, somebody you haven't seen, and offer to buy him lunch for no other reason than, hey, I haven't seen you. Let's go out, sit down and have a conversation just with somebody you haven't seen in a while. All right, let's keep things going here. What's next? All right. Next up is Andrew, uh, Alec Andrew, who says, BJ2 screening at CinemaCon, need a trailer. I have no idea what that is. BJ2 is. Nope. All right. Guys, I, I, I warn you guys all the time, please don't use acronyms when you write in because it, 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 leaves, it leaves us wasting time on screen trying to guess what it is. All right. What's next? Uh, Beetlejuice 2. Oh, I doubt it. Mm. I doubt it. Although, I mean, it'd be getting close to a, a time when it could. Okay. What's next? All right. Uh, then we got Bobby Jackson again. He's back. Uh, if Oppenheimer went up against Dune 2 in the Oscars. No, it would no contest. No contest. Dune would beat the living shit out of it. It, I mean, they couldn't, they wouldn't be able to hand the, it's just, listen, and I say this as somebody who I believe, and I'm cheering for Oscar, for Oppenheimer to win best picture of the year, hundred percent. But there's a reason I said coming out of Dune that Oppenheimer better be thanking the movie gods that Dune 2 moved out of 2023 and moved to 2024, because it would be no contest. It, 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 and I love Oppenheimer. I love it, but it would be no contest. And then the follow-up was that uh, supporting actor, uh, Robert Downey versus Javier. Here's. Rob, tell me what you think of this. It's a tough call. I mean, but I I think Dune could kind of be facing the same situation that say Lord of the Rings Return of the King did. Where if you remember, Lord of the Rings Return of the King has the all-time record, 11 Academy Award wins. No film in history has ever won more. Two others tied it, uh older films tied it, but it, no film has ever won more but not one acting nomination. I wonder if Dune will face the same thing because so many people, the Academy includes, just looked at it as such an ensemble movie that they I didn't actually give any, any acting nominations to it. And I wonder if the same thing might happen to Dune. What do you think? I think you're 100% right. And as much as like I thought everybody, everyone in Dune 2 and Dune 1 was great. Everyone's great. But the thing is, the acting is sort of overshadowed by the film itself. Whereas in Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer is, is a movie about people standing in rooms talking to each other. Yeah. It lives and dies on acting and not so much on spectacle. Op but I, I think the Academy kind of always goes for the more important movies, you know, the movies that have those, what does it mean to humanity? So Oppenheimer was great, but it's like apples and oranges. Mm. So I think that that Dune is a stunning cinematic achievement, but uh, Oppenheimer is 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 a different kind of achievement. It's a beautiful film, incredibly well done, but it's a whole different vibe. You know, it'd be like comparing Return of the King to Shawshank Redemption. You know, which is better? I mean, both Shawshank was nominated for Best Picture. Should have won. Uh, it should have won. But, I mean, it's like, you know what I mean? It's it's a totally different, whereas Dune is an overwhelming cinematic experience that not many people have the power to create. And Christopher Nolan has done something where he can put people in a room and create an overwhelming cinematic See, experience. And one of the reasons why I say I think it wouldn't even be a contest now, like, Dune, Dune, if, like, if Dune had come out in 2023, I 100%, I'd put any amount of money that Dune wins Best Picture at the Academy Awards. And I think one of the reasons is because it's also analogous to Return of the King. In that it became a spectacle movie. You know what it was? It was Star Wars and it was King's Speech. It's it's like it nails great depth, great issues, uh, complex characters, like an Oppenheimer. 
but it's also able to be grand and, and a spectacle and all that kind of stuff. And that's kind of what Return of the King was, right? It, it had all of that put into one, which is why I think it won 11 Oscars and why I think a lot of Oscar voters today would look at, I mean, these two incredible movies in Oppenheimer and Doom, but I, I just don't see a reality in which Oppenheimer beats Dune in the best picture. Right? I'm just glad we have both of them. You know, and, Which is and the best part. there's a great, there's a YouTube video that has Denis Villeneuve and, and Christopher Nolan talking. Who idolize each other, by the way. Yeah. Like Nolan and, and Villeneuve, they idolize each other. They both think that each other are the greatest ever. Which is really, I would love to see them do something so together good. sometime. I mean, Remember when Peter Jackson, Steven Spielberg, they, Tintin. they teamed up to, to do Tintin. And the plan was, okay, we'll do two Tintin films, right? Like, and the first one, I'll produce and you direct. And then the second one, I'll direct and you produce. But they never did make the second one. How cool would it be if, if like, a Christopher Nolan and Denis Villeneuve did something well, like that? Well, they could together. do, like, two evil eyes, George Romero and Dario Argento. <laughs> but we have Denis Villeneuve and we've got Christopher Nolan. Oh, my God, that would be so cool. All right, what's next? Uh, real quick, I just want to bring up the news that Richard Lewis has passed away. <gasps> Uh, it's no. all of, yeah. oh no so that's it. i knew there there was some health issues and i i noticed on this f final season of curb he's literally in like one scene that lasted maybe a minute and a half two minutes so i'm like there's something going on but he was so yeah. funny i loved and him. he yeah, was I loved great in curb he was oh, my that's sad one of my favorite things of curb yeah thanks for bringing that up john yeah all right, what do we got next? Um, then we've got Amin who says, uh, you're doing a Dune 2 open spoiler, right? Yeah, Sunday. Sunday we'll be doing a, because um, that gives everybody Thursday, Friday, and Saturday a chance to see it, and then we'll do the full open discussion, spoiler discussion on Sunday. Now that there's not any football, uh, we'll be doing that on Sunday. All right, what's next? Uh, Matan says, um, do you think instead of a full-on buyout, we see Paramount saved by a rival studio or streamer via stocks, like how Microsoft saved Apple buying uh, by buying uh, stocks back in 1997? Well, they didn't just buy stocks; like they made a big cash infusion into the company and stuff like that. But as Microsoft didn't do that to save Apple. Microsoft did that to make money, right? Uh, by becoming part owners of the company and and all that kind of something that I remember at the time. Woo, a lot of Apple fanboys did not like the fact that they took money from Microsoft because Microsoft was the enemy and all that kind of stuff, right? By the way, there's a great movie kind of about that whole thing called The Pirates of Silicon Valley with Noah Wiley. Yeah. Um, and who played who played the Microsoft CEO? Who played Bill Gates? I'm trying to remember. Another name guy played Bill Gates, I think. But anyway... Uh, Pirates of Silicon Valley, really cool movie. You, you should go check it out when you have a chance. It's older now. It's whatever. Oh, yeah, it was Anthony Michael Hall, Joseph SFL in the oh, wow. chat. Anthony Michael Hall yeah, played Yeah, I remember that now. Bill Gates. It's really, it's a really good little movie. Um, no, I, I don't see that happening. Um, I, I don't think, first of all, I think there would be some legal tanglements there about one studio being part owner of another studio and stuff like that. So I don't know. Plus, that it's a really do. hard thing to do. Yeah, buying a studio is not like buying real estate, where you can look at the you know how much square footage you're paying for and and how much money you're going to return. Spending a billions of dollars on a studio is is an iffy, risky proposition at best. Yeah. Now buying it out, it's, it sounds funny to say buying it outright is a lot e still complicated, still complex, but a lot easier than trying to get into a partial ownership situation. Because then you have control. Yeah. All right, what's next? Uh, Chubb says, people not talking about just how OP Kong is in Godzilla x Kong. Bro, he got Stormbreaker <laughs> and the Infinity Gauntlet. Kaijus will be dusted. Well, I, I'm still fascinated by the one line that Rebecca Hall, but by the way, can I just say, I often talk about, I think, how David Morse is like the greatest character actor out there and people don't know, his, know the name, but you'll recognize him. I think Rebecca Hall might be the most underappreciated omega level actress in the business. I just think she's amazing in everything she's in and she never got the A-list bump. She never got the A-list treatment. And I, I think she is she's omega great. level. I think she's great. Anyway, there's a really interesting line that she says um, in the trailer, which is, I'm paraphrasing. There's something out there Kong and Godzilla both feel it, and they're both afraid of it. And you don't think of afraid and King Kong. You don't think afraid and Godzilla. 
So that's a really interesting line. And we know what's coming, but it's going to be really interesting how they, they play that. I off. think there's something else coming that we don't know is coming. Yeah, because we know that the white dragon thing. What's the name of that thing again? Shimu. Shimu. Or Shimu. 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 The S H I M U. I, I can't remember the name called. of it, but that, you might be right. That might be the name with uh with Scar King. I was thinking the Luck Dragon, Falcor. From yeah, the Fal Ending that's Story. what it is. Falcor the Falcor Luck Falcor is Dragon. coming. There's the crossover we've all been waiting for. <laughs> Falcor, yeah, Trey, you. Um, God, that movie's great. Do you know my um, Wendy Lee, who worked with uh, us over at Clyde? She was my assistant for a while. She became like one of our uh, uh, main administrators. She was working at Sideshow. She had two dogs i loved her dogs uh her and her husband dust they had these great dogs um uh, and one was named falcor and, and i'm forgetting the name of the other one but i think it was also a uh never-ending story reference too but the little dog falcor i think falcor passed away a couple years ago but i love that little dog falcor anyway the luck dragon all right what's next uh sam fisher says i saw a bts video for shogun when he wasn't in front of the camera as toronaga sonata was everywhere behind the camera quickly in and out of costume yeah I, listen he's been in he's been in the movie business a long time i think he's a producer on the show too. i wouldn't be surprised i would explain it i wouldn't be surprised the thing is this guy will pop up anywhere and everywhere and to use one of your phrases, Rob, class up the joint. Yeah. Like, you want to bring another level of gravitas to John Wick 4? Have uh, Hiroyuki Sonata show up in it. You want to try to bring some credibility to a new um, Mortal Kombat? Hiroyuki Sonata. Put him in there. Uh, you want to add him to, like, an X-Men Wolverine movie? Put Hiroyuki Sonata in it. I mean, he his very presence ups the game of whatever he's in but man i'm telling you he was born to play lord toranaga sama he was born to play this role and i cannot wait to watch the rest of it all right what's next all right dr stinky says so i finally watched the godfather nice and wow what a masterpiece the only two films that i think are better are titanic and interstellar keep it nasty it's you know, Robert, we talk about this a lot. I mean, it's the movie that I love watching movies with people who have never seen this particular, whatever movie it is, right? Yeah, I, yeah, love, me too. I love that. No film more than The Godfather. Because at some point, everybody who watches The Godfather for the first time, a light bulb goes off where they're like, every movie I've ever loved has totally been influenced by this film. Like you, like you, you start to recognize, oh, that's where this comes in every movie I've ever seen. Oh, and this is where that comes from in every movie I've ever seen. I mean, Rob, for a lot of people, you know, I've talked about this. The only debate there is in movies is, is Godfather the greatest film of all time? Or is Godfather 2 the greatest film of all time? <laughs> like in a lot of movie circles, that's the discussion, right? Yeah, well, look, I think what, what makes those movies so great is you think, okay, they're mafia movies. But while that's the milieu, Francis Ford Coppola looked at them as as he was making a story about a king and his three sons. Yeah. So within the context of, of the mafia, Cosa Nostra, Coppola is telling a timeless tale of succession and power and all of those great thematic elements that we've seen throughout history in all of the great stories. And that's why Godfather works, because it transcends the genre and, what it, and, it, and is dealing with human truths that have been with us for hundreds of years, all within the context of delicious entertainment. So, All right. What's great next? stuff. All right. Renata W. says, uh, happy hump day, y'all. Hey, team, it's the 20th anniversary of Empire of Dreams, the story of Star Wars trilogy, of the Star Wars trilogy. Uh, what a, a great documentary of the uh, original trilogy. Original trilogy. Um, I had no idea. Kevin Burns, who made that, I, I was a little friendly with, and he he uh, he made some incredible documentaries. He made a wonderful documentary on Cleopatra and 20th Century Fox. He was one of the great documentarians covering the entertainment business. And that might have been his crowning achievement. But 20 years? It's a 20th anniversary? Whew, okay, what's next? Wow. We're old, uh, dude. Yeah. James Ito says, um, over under 35% Deadpool 3 makes a joke about the WGA SAG strikes. Under. It it age it would age too fast. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, first of all, a lot of people even today won't get it because unless you're uh, somebody who really follows movie news, stuff like that, there, I'm sure there are people who didn't even know the actors were on strike. But it's also a, a joke that would get dated really quick. Yeah. So I'm not saying it's impossible, but I would take way under the 35%. What about you, Rob? I don't know. I'm gonna, I'll put it at 35% because they're in multiple universes, so they could make a joke about something. All right. What's next? Uh, we got Ronetta W. back. Apologies. This was part two of my part one. Anyway, if you haven't watched the doc, Light and Magic, do yourself a favor and witness greatness. Yeah, Light and Magic so was good. really quite good. Look, look, one of the things I got to give Disney Plus, because they've been a disappointment on a lot of different levels, but one of the things I really do got to give Disney Plus is even for their bad shows, they're behind the scenes. Like, you know, when every show ends, they do a special because kind of like a little mini documentary about the making of that show. They're always really well done. And it almost like sometimes they even make me wish I liked the show. It's about more <laughs> like, man, I wish I liked the show more because the behind the scenes stuff is so good. But the light and magic thing, as somebody who knows almost everything, because I've just steeped myself like Star Wars has been my life. Right. I've steeped myself in every book and every bit of lore and background thing about every little nuance about what went into making this and blah, blah, blah. Even as somebody who's done that my whole life, I learned a lot in Light and Magic. And, yeah. and, and I saw a lot of new things. What did you think about it? I, dude, I loved it. There was behind the scenes footage I had never seen. Some of that ILM footage is absolute gold. And then hearing about the evolution, like especially the story when they're bringing in more CG work and pioneering that kind of stuff i mean it was amazing like for me it was catnip because i've read i i own every issue of cinefx magazine you know that covered the effects industry beginning with star trek the motion picture and alien and then they went heavily into empire and uh, you know like you i've got star trek reference or star wars reference books and and all kinds of things and there was information there i'd never heard and never seen it was seeing it all that classic ilm footage was gold just amazing all right, what's next? Okay, we got Jay who writes, Hey, John Crew and my pinball partner, Ray. Is, yeah. it, is it just me or does Cosmo, Jarvis, and Shogun look like Tom Hardy and Logan <laughs> Marshall Green had a baby? With love, keep up the film. You said it. Yeah, well, it was Anne that said it, actually. Anne kind of recognized the right. And yeah, it looks like a slightly younger version, a slightly younger brother of Tom Hardy. It, it does. And, but, and he kind of acts like Tom Hardy, too, a little bit. But man, he... You savages! Like it's just—he's so <laughs> good that? in it. So he's good. So good. All right. What's next? Uh, Stephanie Mitchell says with a twenty-dollar super. Oh, chat, thank you so much, Stephanie. Hey guys, happy belated birthday, John. Thank you. Uh, I've seen Dune two, Dune two twice already. Nice. It left me speechless. Got my tickets for opening night and gonna see it Sunday in Regal for oh forty x. Wow. Uh, can't wait for your open spoiler chat. I you know one of the biggest bummers Ann and i were talking about this last night about watching dune when we did because sometimes when we come out of a movie that we absolutely love and it's it's rare that it happens to this level but we're like let's book our next let's book our tickets again boom boom boom, boom. and uh, we couldn't do that because we saw dune and it's like oh that's right there's not another screening for like five days shit what are we gonna do <laughs> and like that was the only down thing about going to that screen it's like i wanted to see it immediately again but we have to wait till Thursday, uh, but I, and I cannot wait. All right, what's next? Uh, Jared Oberfeld says, I declare this week nerd week. <laughs> Shogun Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and Dune Part Two. I am so happy I'm off work this weekend. I don't know ever in the history of the mediums, Rob. And I'll have to, I'd have to look into it. If anybody wants to do some research on this and throw some potentials at me, let me know. But I don't know that there has ever been a week where a movie as good as Dune 2 came out in the same week that a show as good as Shogun has come out. I, I, I If anybody wants to do some research on that and, and throw it at me, I'd love to hear it, but this might be the best week ever. Uh, I, it, no, and, and not only that, but there's a lot of other good stuff peripherally that I'm excited about, whether certain graphic novels, certain physical media releases, the Lego Ornithopter, which I'm in the middle of building. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's just, there's a lot of good stuff for us nerds. All right, what's next? Um, we got Mr. Godzilla. Hey, John, wanted to <laughs> ask if you guys saw the Borderlands trailer and what were your thoughts? Action-wise, set design looked cool, but OMG, who casted this thing? That cast is crazy, though. It is a very eclectic cast. I mean, no doubt. It is, it is a wild, all-over-the-place cast. But 
the characters are kind of that way. So I, I'm going to say this. I, I, until we see the movie, we won't know if it's the absolute most perfect casting or not. We're going to have right. to see the movie. Uh, I am a big fan of Eli Roth. Actually, I don't like every single thing Eli Roth has done, but I, I really like his sensibilities. He brings he brings something to his movies that I've just always enjoyed. And I really like him as, as a person. I've had the opportunity on a few occasions to sit down with him. I, I think he's really cool. Um, so I'm cheering for this movie. The, the trailer didn't really do it for me, to be honest with you. I mean, it was it was all right. There was nothing like I never looked at it and said, oh, my God, and rolled my eyes or anything like that. But it didn't get me all that excited right now. And that's fine. There have been a lot of first trailers I've seen to movies that I didn't think were all that great. And I ended up loving the movie. Hopefully that'll happen here. But I, I didn't love the trailer, Rob. What about you? Like I said, it looked like the Battle Beyond the Stars version of, yeah. <laughs> of Guardians of the Galaxy. It's, I mean, Boy Destroys World to me was the trailer of the week. And and that was like, wow. Um, and, and and I can't wait to see that but because it's got that same insane vibe. But I just thought Borderlands, I'm optimistic. It made me want to see it. All right. I'll just leave it at that. What's next? Nicholas is next and says, thanks to you all for bringing out the passion we all have for movies. Yeah, it's it's great when movie fans get to get get together and we're able to just talk about this stuff. It gets us all more hyped. It does for me as well. Thanks for sharing, man. I appreciate that. All right, what's next? Uh, Ray Loves trench coat says a spoof. <laughs> uh, what? Nothing. Ray Loves trench coat <laughs> says a spoof movie. Oh, is that the name of the person? Ray Loves trench coat? Yeah. Ray, so Ray Loves Trenchcoat says a spoof movie done by Key and Peele would be dope. Uh, yes, it would. And I'm shocked they haven't. You know, well, they I made know, that I know, cat well, movie. Well, they did the cat one called that's Keanu. True, Keanu. That's true. Yeah. But it I, wasn't super. It wasn't, I, wouldn't know, I don't know if I call this. Yeah, I agree, John. I don't know that I call it a spoof movie per se. Um, whole second. Uh, let me do this. Hey, baby, comma. Uh, can you send me the LinkedIn, or not the LinkedIn, the Instagram link of the girl we were trying to set up with Ray. I got to... <laughs> oh, man, don't put her on... I, I, listen, I'm sorry. I got to show you. It's actually more putting you on blast, Ray. <laughs> it's... I mean, Not. this This is... We, we've we talked now for about a year, almost a year, about this gorgeous, oh, beautiful woman that, that everybody had tried to set Ray up with and was really interested in meeting Ray, wanted to meet with Ray... And Ray did not give her the time of day. Why? Because I am rusty. <laughs> because she wore a trench coat. Oh, no. I just, I just made that. What's thing. with that up? Was she trying to solve crime? That's how we heard it all night. <laughs> what? She trying to solve crime? So we're going to just hang on, Ray. guys. We're waiting for that text from Ann. So we're just going to. Yeah, we'll just, just keep talk. going. We're not going to. I don't even know if Ann's got her, Ann's got her phone on her or not. I have Instagram. Don't worry. Oh. You got her Instagram? Yeah. You have her public information? Send me her wow, link. I, I want to bring up a picture so people can see. All right, go ahead and keep going. Keep going. Because she right. wore a trench coat. <laughs> what is she? Gruff McGruff, the crime dog? <laughs> what is she? like? Uh, come on. Sometimes you are delusional. All yeah. right, what's next? <laughs> Amin says, uh, Robert, why doesn't Warner Brothers release the IMAX ratio of Dune for the home on streaming or physical media? Don't want the next month to be the only chance I get to see the film in glorious IMAX. Uh, you got me. I mean, they pioneered releasing with the Dark Knight with changing the aspect ratios in their videos, but I think it's pretty much up to Denis Villeneuve and, and Greg Frazier whether they want to do that or not. I'm sure if they wanted to do it, they would. All right, what's next? Uh, we've got uh, Scotty who says, John, the way you guys gushed over Dune 2 had me very curious about this franchise, so I watched the first one, and now I'm excited to see part two. Thank you guys for making me a believer. Love y'all. One of my absolute favorite things, this goes all the way back to the movie blog days, AMC, Clyde, or whatever. One of my favorite things uh, is when either we or one of our viewers mentions and talks about a film that another one of our viewers has never seen, and then they check it out and they go, oh, I love this movie. Like that is one of the most satisfying things about our job is when a movie fan writes in and says, I got turned on to this movie because of something you or one of the other viewers wrote in and said. And yeah, I that's the best thing about doing this job is when other people find new stuff that they love. And it's even more satisfying when it comes from one of our other viewers. So I'm glad you you discovered it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And now buckle up for Dune 2, man, because you are in for a ride, my friend. All right. 
What's next? I'm um, going to switch over to our members now. Uh, Wesley Cunningham says, is it safe to be excited for the crow yet with these images? Been getting gaslit by this movie for 10 years. Listen, I, I just can't muster any enthusiasm for it. It, it. it has literally been over a decade. It's been Jason Momoa is going to be crow. No, no, no. Oh, Jack Houston's going to be crow. Oh, no. Luke Evans is going to be crow. Oh, no. Tom Hiddleston is going to be the crow. Oh, no. And like, it's just, it's been too many false starts. You know what I mean? Just like way too many false starts. And I, I just can't get excited. Now, I'll go into and watch it with an open mind. Ray still has not sent me that link. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, um, I, will, uh, I will go into it with an open mind and hopefully I'll love it. But it's, it. I'm, listen, man, it's just hard for me to get excited for it right now with the history that we've had with it just getting to this point. Plus the first movie is, I love it so much. I just don't care. Mm. I mean, if, if it turns out to be a great movie, fine. But if they're still going to follow the plot of Jail Bar's comic, there's not a whole lot they can do. And it really comes down to the execution. And The Crow isn't just a great movie. It also has an iconic soundtrack, iconic music, iconic performances and Brandon Lee. And I just think that The Crow captured lightning in a bottle. And I don't see that happening. Although it could. You never know. Yeah, never know. Hope Springs Eternal. All right, what's next? Yo Teach says, uh, TMNT Mutant Mayhem is officially getting a sequel in October of 25, yes. directed by the same guy, too. Um, and for those of you who watch our show regularly, you know that about two months ago, I we, we didn't make it a topic, but we got on the show and we said, I can confirm for you guys as a fact that they are doing the sequel. And now they've uh, just made it official. So, And, and I'm, I'm excited. I, listen, I was not looking forward to the last one at all. But damn, that movie won me over. It's so good. And I'm really excited that they're doing another one. I know Ray is going to be super excited about it too. All right, what's next? Uh, we got CJ Rebirth he says today in 2016, my boy Leonardo DiCaprio finally got an Oscar for his performance in The Revenant. Was that eight years ago? Dude. That was eight years ago? Wow. Holy crap. Um, yeah, I mean, he finally went in for The Revenant, and, and it was a well-deserved one. For, that movie is remarkable. It's it's a remarkable film. Uh, it's just so good. Um, but I can't believe it's been eight years. And it's kind of hard to believe that he hasn't won another one since. Yeah. Um, I'm still kind of surprised he didn't get a nomination. Listen, there are a lot of great nominees this year, so I kind of get it. But I thought he was wonderful in uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. Like, I, I thought he was really, really good in that. So This was one of my favorite memes of that, and it's no longer usable what if in 30 years they make a film about leonardo dicaprio and how he never won an oscar and the asker uh, the actor who played leonardo dicaprio won an oscar <laughs> i still i remember there were a lot of memes about the bear and everything too oh you know what because i do not follow this girl on instagram i can't open her pictures you should. i mean it's yeah you know what tomorrow <laughs> tomorrow <amazing>. tomorrow <laughs> all right well let's got time for one more what's next okay um we got uh, Akshay Thakur who says, Hi, John and crew. Do you think we'll hear the thing say it's clobbering time in the new MCU Fantastic Four movie? Uh, yes. Film? 100%. 100%. Kevin Feige, there's no way he's not he's he's going to let them do that movie without him saying that at least once. Will it come across as a little cheesy? Maybe. But he found a way for Captain... Listen, I, I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if this makes you hate me. Avengers Assemble is, is a really cheesy kind of thing to say. He found a way to make sure Captain America had a chance to say it. Uh, although they didn't do it in the first movie, I definitely think it's clobbering time. As cheesy as it is, they will find a way. He um, He's going to say to Matt, you know, the director of the, the the movie, like, figure out a way to put this in there. And even if it's cheesy, find a way to as uncheesy as possible. But it's clobbering time is definitely going to be said. No doubt. All right, guys. With that down. That'll do it for today's installment of the John Campus Show podcast. Thank you so much for being here and making this show part of your day. Big special thank you to all you guys who sent in the questions. Number one, because you gave us fun things to talk about. But number two, you support our channel as you're doing it. And all of us involved with the show, thank you guys so very much for your support. Uh, I want to thank the guys in the room with me, Ray Ora. See you later. Jonathan Voiko. See you guys. Writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett. Watch Shogun. <laughs> my name's John Campia. And yeah, absolutely. Watch Shogun. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye.